This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. We finally made it. We made it to everyone's favorite season. The one with the best sets, some of the most faithful book adaptations, and the one that introduces the fan favorite narrow gauge engines. Season 4. Thomas and Friends Season 4 is really something special. I have a lot of fond memories of Season 4. This was the one that was readily available in stores when I was a kid, and I tended to lean towards watching those VHS tapes over the ones of the previous seasons. As a little kid, I couldn't tell you why I gravitated more towards Season 4. I couldn't tell you why it was so special then. But as an adult, I can. So let's dive in, and I'll tell you all about it. Season 4's production came off the immense success of Thomas in the US and Japan. Season 3 was a home run season, and Thomas' popularity was reaching all-time highs. With Thomas bringing in more money than it ever had with its success in multiple foreign markets now, not to mention the launch of several major toy lines including Wooden Railway, Tomy Playrail, and Ertel Diecasts, Season 4's budget was higher than any other before it and it finally allowed the team to invest the money and resources in finally bringing the narrow gauge characters to the screen. The past two seasons purposely skirted around the narrow gauge stories in the books because at the time, they didn't exactly know how to accomplish them. These were much smaller engines. How on earth do you fit all the mechanics needed into props of that size in the 80s? The tech just wasn't there then. Season 2 was pieced together using a variety of stories scattered all around the books, and Season 3 was a mesh of railway series stories that they hadn't done yet, and all new original ones. When it came to written Audrey material left to adapt, it was clear the Scarlowy stories were the next major ones to be tackled. So since they had the budget this year, they did. The production team went ham on new props for the show this year, from characters, to sets, to buildings. The concept art for this season is endless. Ambitions were monumental. If season 3 was big, then season 4 was going to be bigger. In the books, the narrow gauge engines were all painted in a single matching color, red with blue lining, to show that they all worked on the same railway. Keeping in mind that toys were now a thing that had to be accounted for in the show, Britt Allcroft and team knew a fleet of engines all in the same color would not sell well. Not to mention it'd make them harder to tell apart. So they made the brilliant decision to make each narrow gauge engine a different color, making up a whole rainbow. Scarlowy in red, Reneus in orange, Sir Handel and Peter Sam keeping their mid-sodor colors, etc, etc. The engines were accomplished by making small engine props that fit on O-gauge track. There of course wasn't room in their tiny bodies for all the mechanics needed to make them puff smoke, etc. So only the stuff absolutely necessary was fitted. They had moving IMEX, which could only be powered by an external battery box. This box was usually hidden off camera, or in a wagon or coach behind the engine. And once you know this is how they did it, you can't unnotice it. Gee, I wonder why Sir Handel has a single enclosed coach in his train right behind him here. Gee, I wonder why Sir Handel is pulling a single enclosed van here. Gee, I wonder why Peter Sam is also pulling a single enclosed van here. These smaller props were not exactly easy to film with, as their valve gear would jam easily. This led them to building much larger scale versions of these characters in the next season, but we'll talk more about that next time. This season harbored the show's 100th episode, Thomas and the Special Letter. This was an adaptation of the story The Fat Controller's Engines, in which a little girl from England writes to the Fat Controller, asking if he can bring all the engines to the big station in London for her and her friends to visit. 
Almost every Sodor engine in the show at this point made a cameo appearance in this episode, as well as Thomas having the craziest crash he's had yet. <laughs> Michael Angelus and George Carlin both return to their roles as the narrators, and both deliver very comforting, soothing performances. Michael Angelus, in my opinion, really settles into his role this year. I don't particularly like Angelus in Season 3. There's just something about his delivery that's a little weird to me, like he's talking too fast or something. This year he tones it down a bit, and his softer performance suits the tone of this batch of stories so much better. If you should visit a place that has a lake in the woods and a beautiful waterfall, then you may also find two little engines called Scarloe and Renace. George Carlin's performance is noticeably different to seasons 1, 2, and 3. He sounds a bit older here, and he talks a little slower, almost like a grandpa telling his kids a bedtime story. On starry nights when the moon is full and the air still, you can hear the sounds of faraway ships and distant laughter. They echo over the hills and through the valley, down calm canals and sleepy inlets. Both of them, though, still of course go to town with their notorious character accents and voice inflections. I shouldn't be treated like this, she grumbled. This pace is too hot for my system. It'll fuse all my circuits. Listen, Dookie, he snarled. Who worries about a few spills? We do here, I said, but Smudger just laughed. <laughs> I'm a shed and sidings inspection, Diesel. Have you any engines in the shed? No. No! Rusty rallied again. Then, uh, what about the sidings? One. We have one. Oh, well, there's no use at all. Tipsy, very clever. Says the Eakin manager. That's the best joke ever! Listen to me. There is nothing wrong with that tunnel. You stuck in it because you tried to do rock and roll. Tunnels are not dance floors, and you are not a pop star. Then Sir Topham Hatt gave his full attention to Duncan's funnel. If it happens again, I shall find ways to cut you down to size. In other words, your career is <clears throat> on the line. Need I say more? Wonderful performances from both narrators this year. This season premiered in the UK via direct-to-home video in late 1994, and finally aired on TV in both UK and US in 1995. Season 4 is one of the most unique seasons of Classic Thomas purely for its structure. The majority of this season is hugely dedicated to the narrow-gauge engines of the Scarlowy Railway and that whole part of the island. 14 of the 26 episodes all revolve solely around them. We're back to a serialized season, with a very strict continuity. Unlike Season 3, which was very episodic in structure, Season 4 is more one long giant story, at least for the first 18 episodes or so. All of the narrow gauge centric episodes sort of make up a whole saga, and you have to watch the episodes in order for the continuity to make sense. Each event that occurs in one episode directly affects the next, and so on. The mid Soto Railway closes, so Peter, Sam, and Sir Handel get sold in Grandpuff. Sir Handel doesn't think the new railway is fit for him, so he rebels, which causes him to damage himself in A Bad Day for Sir Handel, so Peter Sam takes on everything by himself in Peter Sam and the Refreshment Lady. In Four Little Engines, Scarlowey has to step in to help out, but he breaks down and has to be sent away to be repaired, which leads into Rusty arriving in trucks, and so on and so on. And when this huge narrow gauge arc ends, Rusty's story continues into the Stepney episodes, and that is a whole four part thing. It's like one giant 18 parter, a narrow gauge movie, if you will. Once again, we have a season that explores an entirely new part of the island of Sodor and builds out the world more than ever before. Now we learn there's a narrow gauge railway that climbs up the mountain range on the whole east side of the island that we hadn't time to see before. And boy, oh boy, do they go ham on making these scenic mountain locations as beautiful and lifelike as they possibly could. It really does go without saying that the sets in Season 4 were truly the peak of the whole series. I could go into further detail telling you how wonderful and amazing they are, but I think just showing them to you all speaks volumes more.
return to serialization this season, and we also return to a slower, more storybook-like vibe. Season 3 was a lot more adventurous than the previous two seasons, taking the series to new heights. Season 4, while it peaks Season 3 visually in my opinion, delves more into the slower storytelling style akin to Season 1. Season 4 reminds me a lot of Season 1 in a lot of ways. A season where continuity is key, static camera shots galore with depth and details in the foreground, more stories about Engine's personal journeys and serialized character arcs, more stories revolving around smaller slice-of-life incidents, like leaving the refreshment lady behind, or getting a funnel knocked off, or protesting the railway by stopping on a viaduct. Quite a contrast to the bigger, more monumental events of Season 3. We still get some good action, of course, but it happens much more sparingly than last year. So when the crazy stuff does happen, it really makes an impact. Jesus Christ! The remainder of the season is basically just leftover standard gauge stories that were yet to be adapted into the TV series yet. Stories that were skipped in previous seasons like Henry and the Elephant, or Paint Pots and Queens, or Bullseyes. All great stories, but there is no real continuity to them. They were made as a means of giving more of the characters we already know some time in the spotlight, and to wrap up as many remaining stories as they could that hadn't been adapted yet. And as a result of that, there are some weird continuity issues, such as Paint Pots and Queens seemingly taking place after Down the Mine all the way back in Season 1. They even mention the events of that. Then Thomas fell down a mine and Gordon came to his rescue. <laughs> why is it here in Season 4 then? And why are Duck and Donald present? Interestingly, Japan changed the order of the episodes, placing all the standard gauge ones first, and leading into the narrow gauge saga. I tried watching the season in this order, and there are things that I really like about it. I like how it gives focus to all the characters we know before going off into new territory. But I don't like how it changes Special Letter from being the 100th episode, and I don't like how Grandpuff, the intended premiere episode that showcases all the new stuff to expect for the season, is pushed back into the lineup. That's an episode that I think works much better as a lead-in as the first one you watch. Despite some of those weird continuity issues, I would say consistency in the adaptations has risen, albeit the one glaring exception, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Season 3 was very loose in its adaptations of the book stories, altering scenes to include characters like Thomas or adding additional scenes to change the plot slightly or to pad out time. Season 4 was a lot more faithful, in my opinion, in most cases copying the dialogue from the books verbatim. You swank around with steamroller wheels, pretending you're as good as me. Actually, I'm better. Goodbye. You swank around with your steamroller wheels, pretending you're as good as me. Actually, I'm better. Goodbye. But of course, this season was not immune to creative liberties. Thomas is, once again, shoehorned into a couple stories this year he wasn't in originally. I don't exactly blame the showrunners for doing this, however. When 14 of your 26 episodes are focused on characters that do not interact with Thomas in any way, I can understand how you might want to tweak them a bit to give your main character some focus. I respect them for not tweaking all of them, Thomas only appears a couple times in stories he wasn't originally in. And unlike last season, I think Thomas' presence in some of these episodes actually elevates them. Fish, for example, is made into a much better structured story due to Thomas' appearance in the first act. He recalls his previous mishap with Fish all the way back in season one. Well, for one thing, Puff Thomas, remembering his own experience, if fish get into an engine's boiler, they always cause trouble. And I know what I'm talking about. Which provides a nice setup to the even bigger mishap Duck has later with them. Thomas told me to be careful about fish. They got me in a right pickle, didn't they? In the original book story, there is no setup, and the crash just sort of happens. They frame the Duke stories as a story Thomas tells the others. What we need, suggested Toby, is to listen to a story. But, added Duck, it must have a happy ending. 
driver told me a story, said Thomas. So everyone listened. And while I think it's a little weird that Thomas is telling the Duke story instead of someone a bit more appropriate like Edward, I do fucking love how in character he is for it. Thomas just cuts the story halfway through in the middle of the night. That's not a happy ending. There will be, but that'll have to wait until next time. And then goes to sleep, leaving everyone in suspense purposely keeping the ending from them, only to finally tell them it what seems like months later. Duck isn't even present when he finishes it, the one that requested the happy ending in the first place, and he didn't even get to hear it. That's pretty in character for Thomas, the little cheek. We don't get an overly nice Thomas this year, like we did last year. While I'm on the topic of characters, let's get into them. The character rankings this year are going to be crazy. A lot of ties this time. In third place, we have a four-way tie between Rusty, Percy, Toby, and Duck, all with two leading roles each. In second, we have a four-way tie between Scarloe, Duncan, Thomas, and Henry, with three lead roles each. And in first place, another four-way tie between Duke, Sir Handel, Peter Sam, and Stepney, with four leads each. Yeah, see, I told you, this season went crazy with the characters. No shock that due to the higher budget this season had than usual, the show was able to create many, many new character props. There were so many new characters introduced this year, the most of any season, I think. Seven all-new narrow gauge engines, of course. Eight, if you count Smudger. <laughs> and so many memorable one-offs such as Scruffy, Bullstrode the Barge, Come on, come on! <laughs> the Smug Class 40 Diesel, and George, the steamroller with a cause that adamantly protests railways. Railways are no good. Turn them into roads. Pull them up. Turn them into roads. As well as several human characters too, like Tom Tipper the Postman and Nancy the Guard's Daughter. So many new characters, so little time for them all. Stepney is introduced this year, our only new recurring standard gauge character, and notably our first prominent real engine in the series. There's not a lot to say about Stepney, other than his origin story being massively rewritten in the show versus the books. He's a happy guy, and his presence is welcome. I like that he became a minor recurring character after this season, making every time he did appear feel kind of special. As this season was very narrow gauge focused, there isn't really much to say about most of our returning standard gauge characters. Several barely appeared this year, some only getting a cameo in the show's 100th episode. But the ones that did have roles anyway, didn't really have solid arcs or were given any major status quo changes because there just was so little time devoted to them. But there is one I think is worth talking about, and that's Thomas. Thomas, I think, is worthy of a mention this year. His impatient, pricklier, more careless side once again is on full display. Upset about being one-upped by Stepney. Shunted, and on my own branch too. It's a disgrace. Getting offended when Duck doesn't take his advice, and getting massively carried away in showing off to Oliver, with disastrous results. <laughs> At the same time, though, the more grown-up side of Thomas we started seeing last season is also seen here. He calmly tells Percy a story about Duke to teach him a lesson about impatience. He makes an attempt to stick up for Gordon to Sir Topham Hatt. Please, Please sir. sir. One at a time, replied Sir Topham Hatt. He sues Henry after the elephant incident. In a way, I feel like the special letter crash was sort of the violent end to the hot-headed, careless side of Thomas's character the last big time that he really messed up. Because as we'll see in the next season, Thomas isn't really that careless anymore. He's far more matured by next year. Thomas's subtle character growth over these classic seasons is something I think is really overlooked. He's come so far from the cheeky little shithead he was all the way back in season one. Rubbish, said Thomas. You're too fat, you need exercise. Never mind, Henry, murmured Thomas. I think you were brave today and really reliable too. I'd also like to note something about Henry I only noticed on this latest rewatch. Henry constantly gets the short end of the stick this season, and it's always funny. He tries to clear a tunnel and gets hushed by an elephant. 
He gets to pull the royal train, but then that gets ruined by a painter dropping paint on him. He tries to pull the flying kipper again, and in typical kipper fashion, something goes wrong. His selfishness warranted all of these things happening to him. Where's Percy? He's supposed to fetch our coaches. You, snorted Henry, you can't climb hills. Henry grunted dreadfully. So they're not really mean-spirited or anything. But I just find it funny that Henry was the butt of the joke a lot this year. Don't know if that was an intentional thing or not, but it's a funny running gag. With Henry, of all characters. An elephant pushed me! An elephant pushed me! All of the new narrow gauge engines have arcs as well. Every single one of them. They're all in such different places at the end of the season than they were where they started. But who was in the most different place? Let's take a look. Duke, of course, has a major story arc that takes up a whole two-parter and then some. An old curmudgeon grandfather-like figure that takes care of the young'uns, but after getting lost and found again after several years, becomes the one who has to be taken care of. We can keep you in order now. Keep me in order. Be off with you. He at one point saw the young'uns as reckless and overzealous and below him, but is finally happy to be equals with them. Now, all grown up. Scar Lowy, the worn out old engine, gets a chance to prove himself again and saves the day, which leads to him getting overhauled and returning to the railway like a new engine again, ready as ever. Old engines can't pull trains like the young ones can. They can if they're mended, old faithful, and that's what's going to happen to you. You deserve it. Duncan goes from being a thinks-he-knows-it-all blunt, reckless engine. I'm a plain engine, and I believe in plain speaking. To learning a few lessons in humility. He grows to accept diesels, and understands the importance of passengers on their railway. I was wrong. Passengers are important after all. He softens quite a bit by the end of his arc. Rusty, who was kind of a blank slate in the books, is given some time to shine as a central character in a story written especially for him, showing he's a very courageous and selfless character wrapped up in a small, boxy package. Rusty gets the whole season to show he's a reliable character, looking after his friends and the railway, and ends his tenure with the biggest act of selflessness ever. Helps a dying old lion by saving a fellow steam engine from the cutter's torch. A diesel saving a steam engine from scrap. I love how poetic that is, and how that plays into the show's ongoing plot arc about diesels taking over. And while we're on the topic of Rusty, I should probably mention how Rusty technically has no gender in these classic seasons. In the books, Rusty was definitely a he. It's that smelly Diesel's fault. He thinks he can teach me how to stay on the rails, and then goes off and leaves me to find my own coaches. Send him packing. Send him packing, snorted Duncan. But in the TV series, they very purposely never referred to the character as such. It's always just Rusty or the little Diesel. Send Rusty packing, send Rusty packing, snorted Duncan. The little Diesel refused to move. This was Britt Allcroft's attempt at introducing a gender-neutral character into a group of predominantly males. I'm not sure why she chose Rusty of all characters, and Rusty would go on later to be referred to as he in the series, hence why I've been referring to him as he here, and would be given a very clearly male voice. Even so, you were still late, teased Rusty. But the lack of a specific gender in season four was definitely pretty progressive for the time. In the mid-90s, almost 30 years ago, just another instance of Thomas, once again, being way ahead of its time. Sir Handel, once a young, self-absorbed complainer, becomes a... Well, an older self-absorbed complainer. He didn't really change that much, but I think that's the point. Some things never change. Oh dear, he's worse than ever. And while Reneus had the least amount of screen time, even he got a little hero's journey epic as well. Breaking down at his lowest point and risking everything to get his train home to help the passengers. However, I think the character with the biggest journey of all this season was Peter Sam. Peter Sam was really put through the ringer this year. He started out as a young, careless engine, gets one-upped by his grandpa. Poor old engine. It's no good, Stuart. You can't win. Then his line closes down, and he loses his grandpa forever. Gets sold to another railway and has his name changed. 
in which he at one point has to run said new railway all by himself. Then he gets to reunite with his long-lost grandpa, flurry of emotions there. Then he gets into a terrible accident that mangles his funnel, which later then gets knocked off by an icicle. And finally, finally, ending with him getting a new weird-looking one. Oh dear, exclaimed Peter Sam. Someone squashed it. That makes him be the best performer on the line. I can't understand it. Peter Sam seems to just stroll along the line. He makes work look so easy. Holy crap, he went through so much. And yet, he's still the happiest and most optimistic of the bunch. What a good little role model he is. Peter Sam, in my opinion, rightfully deserves the MVP award this year. It's really no wonder the narrow gauge engine still struck a chord with fans to this day. They're all so charming and every single one of them had a solid character arc all within this one season. These cute, small, skittles-colored engines placed in the most dramatic and grandest and awe-inspiring and scenic part of the island of Sodor. There's something very thematic about that. A visual metaphor for the biggest adventures come in the smallest of packages. Season 4 is seriously going to be a hard one to choose episodes for, because there's such a good selection this time around. I think the standout episode of Season 4 goes to, and this will absolutely be a controversial choice, Rusty to the Rescue. Hear me out on this one. This is a season where every episode in it is based on an existing book story, ditching the experimental mesh that we had back in Season 3, and returning to the book roots like in Seasons 1 and 2. As a result, this one episode that isn't based on anything stands out like a sore thumb. Rusty to the Rescue was this season's only episode not based on existing Audrey written material. It was totally concocted by Britt Allcroft, and the sort of simplistic dialogue in it kind of shows. Can you help me find another engine? Where? Where you found Oliver. This episode basically existed to give the new character Rusty his own spotlight episode, and to change Stepney's origin so they could have more creative freedom with him. I understand people not liking this change because it alters real life history, and the fact Rusty is able to travel to the other railway on narrow gauge tracks is borderline farcical. I totally get it, and I agree with that. In a way, this episode was a trendsetter for the series. The mark of the start of realism not always playing a factor in every story. We'll see how they take that to all new levels in the next season. You can argue that's a good or a bad thing, and that's the overall point I'm making here. I see this episode as a standout because it is controversial. In the same way something like Star Wars The Last Jedi will be discussed till the end of time because it made some weird decisions that didn't please everyone. I feel like Rusty to the Rescue will be the same. Hell, it has been. It's almost 30 years old and we're still talking about it. Visually, musically, and vocally, it's undeniably a beautiful episode with glorious shots that stick with you. I don't think it's necessarily the best Season 4 has to offer but I definitely think it's the one people will remember the most of this year's bunch. Now, worst episode is one I think many can agree with me on, and that choice goes to Special Attraction. Special Attraction is just a weird episode. It's a mesh of two completely unrelated railway series stories, one about Toby going to be the special attraction at a seaside festival, only to be turned away when he gets there, and another about Percy killing Bulstrode the Barge. Oh, I'm sinking! How do these two relate at all? The Toby plot has no resolution either. Toby becomes sad and then we just kind of forget he's in the episode. They've meshed stories into a single episode before in the past. Take Whistles and Sneezes for instance. That one worked because both stories were about Henry overcoming bully characters. So they played into the larger goal of Henry coming out triumphant. These two, though, there is nothing tying them together, besides this very weirdly forced last line of dialogue. Well, we've both had some seaside surprises today, laughed Toby, but Driver says that I'm a special attraction anyway, and so are you. What? The Bullstroke crash is awesome, don't get me wrong. And again, I don't hate this episode. 
but it is definitely the weakest and strangest one of the year. And for the sum up, I believe the episode that sums up season four in a nutshell is Grand Puff. What can I say? It's the season premiere and it perfectly showcases everything this season has to offer. Beautiful, gorgeous mountain sets that visually show the viewers were in a brand new part of Sodor we've never been to before? Check. A slew of new charming little narrow gauge characters in the limelight? Check. World building and backstories to these new characters and railways? Check. Varying tones, including funny? Grandiose. And all three were happy together for many years. Somber. Winter torrents wash soils from the hills. Trees and bushes grew all around. You wouldn't have known a shed was there, let alone a little engine asleep inside. And eerie. One winter's night when the cold wind blew. Check. Grandpuff is the best intro to the world season 4 has in store, and it showcases it all beautifully. I'm going to add a new category to the episode sections of these retrospectives, and that is my favorite episode. Standout and favorite are not always the same thing. Standout means I think that's the episode most people will remember the most after watching, while favorite is personal. My personal favorite episode of season 4 is, and it's been my favorite forever, I've mentioned it a million times before, Special Funnel. I adore the serene atmosphere of this one. There's so many sequences with very little narration, and the viewer is forced to take in these gorgeous, stormy landscapes alongside this somber music and sound effects. It's such an experience. I love how much of a presence Mother Nature has in this episode, how much of a force it presents, having its way with the railway washing away bridges, and creating thick icicles that knock engines' funnels clean off. Fish is my number two because I love the way the engines are filmed in this one particularly. Wide, crowded industrial shots where the engines are facing away from the camera so they appear more like machines than living beings, and these low, dynamic camera angles as the engines pass the camera. They feel so goddamn real, man! And because I'm sure many will ask in the comments, here's my favorite episodes from the previous three seasons. My favorite from season one is The Flying Kipper, same as the standout in that season. Season two is Edward's Exploit, no shocker there. And season three is Escape, also the standout again. I'm so basic, I know. The word I would use to describe season four is comfy. I can't think of a better word to sum it up with. This is a season where everything is eye candy, where the stories are a little slower than before. The tone is very atmospheric, ranging from adventurous to whimsical to eerie to somber, and the narrator's deliveries are so soft-spoken and soothing. This is the season I would choose to snuggle up in a blanket with a hot chocolate and just get completely lost in. Season 4 is so damn comfy. I don't think there is a season that world built as much as Season 4 did. We learned so much about this whole other half of the island of Sodor we never saw before, and they introduced a whole narrow gauge world that they did so much with and will later do so much more with. The trains themselves felt so real this year. Sodor feels more like a real place in the world than it ever has before. We are still firmly in the golden era of the series. Season 3 kicked it off, and Season 4 ran with it. It's kind of crazy thinking just how much of this universe was built out in only four seasons. We basically have seen the whole island by this point. What more could they possibly do in the next season? Well, as we will find out, Season 5 is quite the roller coaster ride. The golden era of Thomas will continue to pound along.
Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. The Thomas Retrospective has really come along. I didn't think I'd get through the first four seasons this quickly. Hopefully at this rate, we'll be through the first five seasons within a month or two. And then maybe onto that Thomas and the Magic Railroad analysis I'd been promising you all forever. We'll see. I also apologize if my voice sounded kind of off in this video. I'm actually getting over having COVID. I feel fine now, but I don't think my voice is back at 100% yet. I want to use this opportunity to talk about my channel for a bit and what the plan is for future projects, and the status of some current ones. The next big video is to be determined. That's one that will be voted for in the poll on my Patreon. Although I think by the time this video is out, that will have already been decided. So, well, if you're a patron, you know what's coming next. Join my Patreon if you'd like to vote on the next big video. So, Tugs Trains. A lot of people have been asking when the next Tugs Trains is coming. Uh, the truth of the matter is that I have not had time to work on models at all in the last few months. My engines are all packed away at the moment, so that series has taken a little break. I'm going to be moving to a new place soon, and my plan is to eventually build an actual layout in the new spot. When that happens, I'll bring Tug's Trains back and I'll do something special with it. What exactly? Well, no idea at the moment, so stay tuned. Thomas Debunked! This has been one of the most consistently running series on my channel. They're a great way to talk about small anecdotes of information that wouldn't exactly make up a big video, and they help keep my channel views up. I am taking a little break from it though, as I think my bigger projects need some more time devoted to them. Once I'm a little more caught up on some larger stuff, I'll jump back into the bunk. It's not done yet. That's all from me for now, folks. I'll be back with more very soon, so don't go anywhere. See y'all in the next one.